In North Carolina in 2020, according to the North Carolina DOT, there were about 1,600 overall fatalities due to motor vehicle crashes. Out of those, over a quarter, or 412 deaths, were due to drunk driving. Drunk driving kills, period. We all know this. So maybe you're watching this video because you or a loved one has been injured by a drunk driver. Perhaps you're watching this video because one of your loved ones has been tragically killed by a drunk driver in North Carolina. Some of you may be feeling that the law just doesn't do enough to deter people from drunk driving, and that's probably true, uh, you know, given the statistics that I just recited. However, what I can tell you is that insofar as the civil law is concerned, usually a case against a drunk driver which causes injury or death is going to result in higher damages than one caused by somebody who wasn't intoxicated. And not only this, in North Carolina, there's another option that you don't have in Virginia um, that you can go after the bar that served the drunk driver alcohol if they got their alcohol from a bar or other establishment that serves alcohol. Uh, that Assuming that we, you can prove that that bar or other establishment that served the alcohol knew or should have known that this person was clearly intoxicated and was going to get in a vehicle after they left the bar. Hi, I'm Joe Miller, personal injury attorney, uh, car accident attorney, and, and workers' compensation attorney in Virginia and North Carolina. And I'm here today to talk about exactly that, uh, drunk driving in North Carolina and how you can recover and how these cases are treated a little differently than your normal car accident case in North Carolina. So first, let's deal with the drunk driver. What are the, these laws that I'm talking about that may entitle someone who's injured or killed by a drunk driver um, to get more money? And I'm talking about some special laws in the category of what is known as punitive damages. Punitive damages are related to just what it sounds like, to punish, punish the reckless person who got drunk and decided to get into a multi-ton vehicle and drive down the road and cause an accident. It's also designed to deter or prevent the kind of very dangerous conduct that we don't want people to engage in, in this case, driving drunk, okay? Now, what do you have to prove in order to be entitled to punitive damages? Well, the legislature in Raleigh has told us that first you have to prove the regular part of your case. In other words, that you're not, you're not gonna get punitive damages if you didn't hurt anybody. Um, you know, there has to be an actual injury, there has to be damages awarded by the jury for normal things such as medical bills, uh, pain and suffering, lost time from work, things like that. If you wanna get punitive damages, you got to prove that the defendant engaged in what is known as willful and wanton conduct. So unlike Virginia, uh, and by the way, if you're injured in Virginia by a drunk driver, I encourage you to watch my video on that because the laws are a little different. Um, North Carolina really hasn't set forth a kind of magic number in Virginia. If you're able to prove over 0.15 in the blood alcohol, you're entitled to a presumption of punitive damages under those circumstances. North Carolina doesn't have that. Um, rather, the approach of North Carolina and the legislature and what they've passed in North Carolina is kind of to go through a laundry list um, of things that really have to do with proven punitive damages uh, in any case, including a drunk driving case. And I'm going to go ahead and mention some of these items. And I, that is not to say that the blood alcohol content, as you will soon see in a minute, is not important. Um, it's just that there's no magic number. So the first couple of things they want to look at is you look at what's called the reprehensibility of the defendant's motives and conduct, okay? Rep we all know what reprehensible means, a terrible thing that they're doing. Second thing the jury can look at, and these are kind of related, is the likelihood at the relevant time that the defendant's conduct is gonna cause serious harm. And it seems to me that these numbers, one and two here, the first things on these, this laundry list that are in the statute for drunk driving in North Carolina, really do involve the BAC. Because you know if your BAC is some crazy number, uh, way, way above what the legal limit of 0.08 is, uh, you're going to be obviously more aware that, you know, look, I'm, you're drunk out of your mind and you should know better than to get in a car um, and start driving. While we're mentioning BAC, as we discussed on the Virginia side uh, in that video, it goes by, when we're looking at blood alcohol, it always goes by your blood alcohol at the time of the accident. So even if you get a BAC uh, test, that's done, let's say, two hours after the accident, you know, and it, let's say it's 0 0.07, so it's just below the, you know, you're just under the legal limit for being too, having too much alcohol in your system and, and being subject to a DUI, an expert can easily come in, look at the drunk driver's weight, et cetera, and 
come to an opinion that no, that was two hours after the accident. At the time of the accident, that person's blood alcohol would have been much higher and would have been well over the legal limit. So those are the first two items, reprehensibility and the likelihood that the defendant's conduct is going to cause serious harm. So the next item the jury can consider in awarding punitive damages is the degree to which the defendant was aware of the probable consequences of his or her conduct. The drunk thing kind of plays both ways on that. I mean, you could argue if you're too drunk to know what you're doing, then okay, you may not be aware. But let's assume that the defendant in this case has had prior DUIs. Usually people that have a DUI have to go through a alcohol education program where they're explain, it's explained in great detail what happens when you drink alcohol and you get behind the wheel of the car. So, you know, those folks are going to be well aware of the probable con consequences of their conduct when they start drinking and they contemplate getting behind the wheel. So that's number three. Number four is the actual damages suffered by the claimant or victim. We talked about this before. Obviously, the more serious the injuries, particularly if there's a death, God forbid, that was caused by drunk driving, the punitive damages are likely to be much higher. Next factor the jury can consider is the existence and frequency of any similar conduct. And this is where the law really differs um, from you know, common law in most other cases. Usually, the only things you can bring up as far as crimes in any uh, civil case are previous felonies or in, um, crimes involving lying, cheating, or stealing, which are commonly known as moral turpitude. In a drunk driving punitive damages case, uh, where you're trying to prove punitive damages, you can actually bring up how many times has this person, you know, been caught driving drunk, been convicted driving drunk, how many times have they, you know, caused a crash or anything like that, all relevant to punitive damages. Finally, the jury is entitled to look at defendant's ability to pay. What that means is the judge will usually split the case into two different sections. The first, trying to find out if the plaintiff has proven their case as far as you know the damages, et cetera. And also if the plaintiff has proven that the defendant is guilty of, you know, of such reprehensible conduct, et cetera, that they're liable for punitive damages. At that point, once those things are found, then you're going to move into the damages part of the claim. And that is where the defendant's ability to pay becomes relevant. You know, you're looking at a very wealthy person who has a great ability to pay. You know, they, they have a lot of assets. That person's going down. Finally, you know, there's another way that the legislature has really shown that they have put a priority on stopping this kind of behavior and how egregious it is. Um, normally, there's a cap in North Carolina, three times compensatory damages. In other words, whatever your damages are, if the jury finds a verdict for, let's say, $100,000, they want to put punitive damages on top of that. They can only go either three times the compensatory damages, which will be $300,000 in my example, but it's, there's a cap maximum of $250,000 for punitive damages in North Carolina. However, this uh, cap does not apply to a claim for punitive damages arising from a situation where the defendant was found to be driving impaired in a criminal court. In other words, if the person was convicted of a DUI coming out of the same accident, there's no cap to punitive damages. But, you know, if you are only got this one defendant, the person that hit you and nobody else, okay, you have to look always always at the insurance coverage. What I mean is that the minimum limits in North Carolina of automobile coverage are $30,000 per person. So that means unless you have very high uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage on your policy, you know, let's say uh, well over the $30,000 limit, no matter how high your damages are, I mean, you can have a million dollar verdict, you know, from the jury. But, you know, if there's not enough insurance coverage, you can forget it. You know, if the case is worth you know, $30,000 is all the coverage there is, your case is worth $30,000. What about their stuff? What about, can I go after them if they got a job or whatever? You know, can I go after the drunk driver? And the answer is that yes, you could, but it's unlikely in most circumstances that you're going to end up with a penny from that. Uh, the reason is that, you know, people that are driving around with minimum coverage, okay, usually don't have a big mansion and a lot of money, you know, in the bank. Uh, there's a reason they're driving out with minimum coverage, not to, dis you know, despoil them or speak badly about them. It's just a fact. So while there's no love loss between myself and the insurance companies, I mean, I go against them all the time. Um, I highly recommend that you purchase as much underinsured and or uninsured motorist coverage that you can afford on your own policy to help you sleep a little better at night. Let's switch gears for a minute. Let's say, God forbid, your loved one has been horrifically injured by a driver that was clearly well over the legal limit. 
um, at the time of the accident, uh, or if you unfortunately lost someone to this criminal act of another person hitting the road and being drunk, you know, they got convicted of DUI. And as we said, that drunk driver, as is often the case, either doesn't have coverage or has minimal limits. Um, is there anything else you can do? The answer in Virginia is no, okay, there's not. In North Carolina, the answer may be yes, okay? And that's in a situation where a bar or other establishment that serves alcohol serve the drunk driver alcohol when the folks at the bar knew or should have known that that driver or pretend person that was gonna get in the car was already intoxicated and that they knew or should have known that that person who was driving was gonna be driving when they left the bar, okay? And that's commonly known as dram shop law, okay? And so the deep dive details of that, you know, are not for now, but if you think you or a loved one was injured by a, a drunk driver who was served alcohol at a bar, um, and, and you know, you might have a potential claim against that bar, you know, I encourage you to give us a call. Uh, what I want to get across to you, though, is that the, like the law with the drunk driver, um, there's also a possibility that you get, you could get punitive damages against the bar as well. The basic law, as I said before, is that the bar and its employees and managers are under a duty not to serve an impairing substance to a patron who is likely to become under the influence of that substance and is likely to be operating a motor vehicle shortly thereafter. But what bar doesn't do that? I mean, you know, more importantly, why do they do that? Because everybody knows that's where the money is in the business. And the money ain't from the food. Money's from the alcohol. But there's no doubt that some bars are better about this, you know, serving alcohol to drunk people, and others are much worse. If you can show that this no limits approach, okay, to serving alcohol in the, is the business practice or strategy of the bar or its ownership company or companies, that is to routinely serve alcohol to clearly buzzed and drunk patrons who then drive away from the bar, now you've got a possible intentional, willful, wanton conduct, which could easily be subject to punitive damages. So in North Carolina, you definitely have another potential avenue of recovery besides just against the driver, assuming that the driver became intoxicated from drinking at a bar, a strip club, or some other establishment that serves alcohol. So I hope this video on North Carolina drunk driving and punitive damages and actions against establishments that serve alcohol um, in North Carolina have been helpful for you. If you or a loved one has been injured in a car accident caused by a drunk driver, either in North Carolina or Virginia, uh, please don't hesitate to give us a call at the number on the screen. Or if someone close to you has been tragically killed um, by a drunk driver, either in Virginia or North Carolina, please don't hesitate to call us and we'll get to work on helping those of you who are left behind to grieve this terrible thing, okay? Again, I thank you for watching. Uh, God bless. Joe Miller out.